Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David, and I work as a software engineer in peer-to-peer -peer applications at a very cool place called Protocol Labs. We build technologies, protocols, to make the web better. And today, I want to talk to you about one of those protocols called IPFS. It is going to be a very long talk, so I'm going to give you a run-through beforehand um, and explain what I'm going to talk during this 15-minute presentation. It's going to be something. Uh, so before going into IPFS, I want to make sure that we are all settled in the same frame of mind of how the internet work, uh, works and how we got to the place where we are today with the web. Uh, after that, I want to talk about IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, and then like no, not like a technical talk to be complete needs to have a cool technical demo. So I'll show you IPFS working, and then I also want to mention if we have the time for it, IPLD, the Interplanetary Linked Data. And last but not the least, I want to talk about the IPFS community, how it works, all these projects I've developed, and invite you to be part of it. So let's get started with a quick preamble. So it's kind of like remarkable how we change in four to five decades uh, several times the way that we communicate. Like even starting even in the very beginning, like in 1960, uh, when ARPANET appeared, like the first packet switch network, we finally had a way to like alleviate operators at all and just have a way to communicate from one machine to another machine without having like have mechanical contraptions linking circuits together. Um, however, this had a problem, right? We had to know the network and how the network was organized. Like, there was no way for me to dial to another machine without knowing the state of the network. This graph from ARPANET, it's kind of like 17 years later, but um, it kind of like shows how complex the network was and the amount of knowledge that you had to have from this network in order to know which machines are connected where and how to dial to them. Like, it evolved a little bit, and like in 1974, PUP, the Park Universal Protocol, uh, was finalized. PUP was a protocol to enable like networks to connect to other networks. It was a way to know where a machine was connected so that I could route my packets to it. It was kind of like a predecessor to TCPIP, and they didn't know about TCPIP at that time, but TCPIP was really on its early stage. Um, and then 82, like uh, eight years later, TCPIP is introduced as a standard networking protocol. And we got like something like this, right? Like we have machines connected to the network, we finally stopped worrying about where the, net, uh, net, the machine was connected. We just have an address that you, we could like, send our packets to, and we knew that the, the packets would arrive. It was also the first time that reliability on a communication channel was introduced. However, IP had a problem. Like, if I change my machine from one point to another, now I have to tell the entire network that my IP has changed. And to overcome that, uh, DNS, in part, was introduced. And with DNS, now we have like a central server uh, where it keeps a table of all the machines that are interesting on the network. So if a machine is interesting, it gets a, a, um, a record on this table. And if the machine moves from place to place, we can still reference the same machine by a name, but getting the latest IP address that the machine is available on. Um, and then like the World Wide Web happened, and like this explosion of apps. Uh, uh, came with it, like these services that we use to communicate with our loved ones, to run our businesses, to do our software development, uh, basically live on top of this infrastructure that was set for us. However, there is a really uh, small but big problem, which is if we lose the connectivity to the backbone, all of these services that we use and we learn to rely on them are gone. Like simply, they just break. And it doesn't even have to be a full internet blackout, just like a partial disconnection and these services stop working. But the internet was not developed to work this way. Actually, like, uh, this is a very old image about like, the type of networks. And ARPANET, the goal of the project was like, exactly to uh, survive to an attack. It was a military project where if the US United States was under an attack and like, the communications was destroyed in part, the rest of the, the nodes should still work and like, should still be able to communicate. Um, nevertheless, like, we managed to evolve our network, but we evolved to this centralized um, architecture, and we really need to make it distributed again. Like, in simple terms, the current model has some problems, and it comes like, from an a early decision that made a lot of sense at the time and made things very simple, which was location addressing. As I said, like, with the introduction, uh, introduction of DNS, we started referencing things by name. 
And when we reference things by name, it gets us this really nice convenience of like having a domain name that gets translated into a machine address. And now we know where the resource that we are looking for exists. And this is super convenient, right? Imagine like a very big, large network. We know which machine to contact and like to get our file from. It was like super convenient. Uh, the problem is, imagine like this room is the room that we are sitting in here, or even like the entire conference. Uh, if I want to share a picture with all of you, uh, I need to upload my picture to some service outside of the room. And now, like, even though I'm on the same room as you, and I have the picture, I was the one sharing it, you have to all go to this other place to download the picture. And even more ridiculous is the fact that like, every single one of you will create a separate connection to download the same bits. Um, with images, this might not seem a problem, but like, let's think about video. So like, a video from YouTube, like a typical one, like medium size, 200 megabytes, giving an example of Gangnam Style. Uh, if it has to be routed to uh, 8 hops, uh, to 30 machines, we put a weight in the network of 48 gigabytes. Um, and like, the, this video has to be transferred the same bits over and over again through all of these hops. And the internet is actually way bigger. It's more than 8 hops from our uh, computer to the backbone to the servers where this video lives. But like, Gain and Assign is really a good example because like, it was the most seen video of YouTube of all time, and it has been seen more than like, two and a half uh, billion times, and that converts more or less like a rough estimate to like, 530 petabytes. So we are literally, like, we put a, a pressure on the network to transfer 530 petabytes of the same bits over and over again, even when we play two times on the same machine. Uh, and then, of course, there's the bandwidth problem. Like, we have seen over the years that like, bandwidth is not necessarily increasing. Like, there is a lot of things that have been developed, but bandwidth keeps, like, the average keeps being the same. And, but one thing in contrast is like, the prices of storage are decreasing. And each time we are creating more data, we, each time we are creating like, better movies, now we have 4K, like, a couple of years ago, we just had 1080p. And like, these things take space. And everyone wants to access all, to all of these things at the same time. So if the storage cost decreases and the bandwidth stays still, what is going to happen is like, the internet will like, look slow. Like, in a couple of years, the internet will look very slow because it will take a lot of time to see a video. But what's happening is just like, the, the, like, the network doesn't have enough bandwidth to cope with all of the people that are seeing these videos. Then there's the problem of latency. Like this is like a, a, an image from Amazon and Google and where they have their data centers located. You can see at first sight that like there is clearly areas where that are privileged areas, right? Like Europe, United States, a little bit in Brazil, some parts in Asia, they have data centers very close to them. All of the other parts in the world don't have a data center. And like the solution for this is not like just build more data centers, that, that doesn't scale. We have to have a way to transfer data around the, the network and make it smarter. And then there's like the disconnected offline scenarios. You probably already experienced this even in this conference. Uh, like we want to access the internet. We want to collaborate with our fellow hackers here. And like we want to share our files. And like we might be working on the same file together. And suddenly the Wi-Fi drops. And like we cannot work on the same document anymore. And again, the case is the same. Like we are all in the same room. Why the heck doesn't it work? And like if you go through all of the services that are most commonly used, all of these break as soon as the connection to the backbone uh, is offline. And these are some of the problems with the current model, like low bandwidth scenarios, the interference. Uh, there's a lot of congestion, a lot of people accessing the same data over and over again over the same radio spectrum. Data, data centers can like fail, can be destroyed. Um, ISPs can go down, and our, we are just traveling, and like you cannot have the same connectivity in a plane or in a train that you get in your houses. Um, not, uh, yeah, so adding to all these problems, there is also problems with like, control, like surprise censorship. We have seen that a couple of times happening in the last decade where like, a government just decided, oh, now I'm going to cut, cut the internet. And suddenly like, an entire population cannot access to the resources that we take for granted today. Or even the case of permanence. We have been seeing a lot of services um, in the web today, just like shutting down, and all of the knowledge, all of the value that was created on this, those services, like entire blogs, are just gone. Because even if the people that wrote those blog posts, that wrote those articles, move those articles from one side to another, the links will break. So if I have a website that points to a link 
it was a uh, service that was shut down. Now my link will not ever work anymore. Um, so yeah, these are a lot of problems, and there is more. The fact that our data is not encrypted at rest, the fact that IoT doesn't even speak the web. We, people are building custom protocols because they know the web has these issues and they need to move internet connectivity to these small devices, and the web is not working for them. Is that a solution for this? Yeah, uh, and it's called IPFS. And th this is what I'm here to talk to you um, today. IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System, and it is a protocol to upgrade the web. It, this is really important, like a, pro a protocol to upgrade the web. It's not an alternative web. It is not something that like, the users have to buy in. Like, from the user's perspective, they don't, should not even notice the difference, other than the cases that the normal internet will not work, and it will start working once they use IPFS. Why IPFS? Why the interplanetary file system? Well, um, so someone had to take internet to Mars, right? Like you have seen movies about like science fiction. You always like see these like sad Martian faces. They want the internet too. Like it is not by chance that like they always look so sad. It's like oh my god, I want to go online and I cannot. No, this is like of course I'm joking. It is for a more serious reason. Uh, interplanetary file system is an homage to GCR Lake Lider, which original idea has inspired ARPANET. He talked a lot about the intergalactic network, a network of networks that uh, managed to connect the entire galaxy together. Um, and also because it really means business. Like it really means that like, we are challenging ourselves to build a system that's robust enough to work across planets. And when we bring these like, futuristic technologies to the to the current day, we actually solve a lot of problems in our own systems and make it work, make these systems work in scenarios like remote locations, completely disconnected scenarios that otherwise it would not work. So IPFS is really just a connection, a connection, a collection of great ideas. Uh, takes inspiration from other great systems, the self-certified system, Git, BitTorrent, DHTs, and more. And we kind of like mash them together and make a real, like deploy this protocol that is really nice to work with and that web developers, that web uh, architects can use. And in simple terms, it offers you two things, content addressing and process addressing. So explaining first what is content addressing. Content addressing is a way to identify a file, a piece of content uniquely. Like you cannot have two identifiers to the same content. Uh, this comes from a thing called the Merkle trees. Like in the beginning there was this Merkle tree and the Merkle tree taught us uh, how to link content in an immutable way. So instead of like having content that like just links by a memory pointer or just by a reference in some database, we actually hash the first content that we want to link on the second content and we store that hash on the second blob, the one that's linking backwards. What this means is like if I give uh, an hash to someone and if that person receives a piece of content, they can validate that the content that they received was the one that they were looking for. And this is called the Merkle link. The, it's called the Merkle link because this idea was created by Rolf C. Merkle in 1980, and this was the first Merkle tree. And you are probably used to use Merkle trees today, even if you don't know it. Like Git is a Merkle tree. Um, Bitcoin is a Merkle tree. Uh, other systems, BitTorrent, that use this type of tech, this type of Merkle linking to operate. And if you heard in the past that like money doesn't grow on trees, I guess they need, never learn about Bitcoin, right? Um, so IPFS intuitively is kind of like this Merkle forest where all of these other Merkle trees can live together. And just to explain how this is powerful, let's like rewind a little bit and like remember the golden days of CVS and SVN. <laughs> when entire teams would like, stop working when a server would go down. So in CVS, SVN, you had like, this central server, and you had like, several people participating and like, collaborating on this piece of code, and then like, if some of these people got disconnected, they were completely like, out of the participation on all development of this code. Or if the server was gone, like, no one could work that day. It was like, okay, let's drink some coffee or like, go home soon. Uh, but then Git changed everything. Git said, okay, let's put every machine speaking the same protocol, and instead of like talking about clients and servers, like just like everyone speaks the same protocol. So when you lose your connection in Git, you can still continue working. If a server goes down, you can still continue working and you can collaborate directly with from machine to machine. And like Git doesn't care, right? Like Git like 
half of the network can go down and like, the rest of the network can still work. And when the, the rest of the network go, comes up, then you can like, converge and like, make sure everything works nicely again. And IPFS is doing this for the entire web. So uh, in IPFS, we call this Merkle tree structure the Merkle DAG, uh, direct acyclic graph. And in IPFS, like, data forms always a DAG. And it's called the Merkle DAG because the links are the ashes. So, and we can represent really any uh, data structure in a DAG, like it's just a graph. Unix files and directories can be represented in a, direct, uh, in a, in a DAG, Git is already a DAG, Bitcoin is already a DAG, and we can also build um, key value stores in a DAG. There's also actually people working right now on building a full SQL semantics on top of IPFS. It's kind of impressive. So let's look at like, one specific case. Uh, how can we mount files and directories on a DAG? So like files can be DAG nodes, can be just like a node on, the, on this DAG tree. Big files can be split in many chunks. So instead of like having this node that's really hard to transfer, you just chunk it often and then like it makes it easier uh, to transfer. And directories can be a node that points to other nodes. And which can point to other directories or even more nodes. So what this translates to, instead of like having the traditional domain name to location, now you have domain name to ash of the content. And looking again at the network graph, instead of like me asking to one machine, to one central point of authority for the content that I'm looking for, I can ask the entire network and I can validate the content. This like was a big problem. Like HTTP caching still sucks today because like the browsers have a really hard time understanding what can they really cache. Like caching validation is still one of the biggest problems and it is simply because I can like open a website, a video player, play a video, and then like refresh the play page, play again, and it will download the entire file again because it has no way to tell that the, those bytes it already has on the machine are the ones that it is looking for. But with IPFS, you cannot ask anyone for the content or even yourself. And since you are like asking by the hash, you can see, oh, like this piece of content, does it hash to the same thing that I'm looking for? Yes, okay, so I already have it. Cool, so that was Merkle DAG and content addressing. Everyone still, okay, everyone following? Awesome, thank you. Uh, let's talk about process addressing. Because we want IPFS to be, be fully peer-to-peer -peer and not have to rely on any central servers, we needed to find a way to address processes that exist in the network independently of where they are. And that uh, was an endeavor that we started that eventually became a, a full standalone project called Lee Peer-to-Peer. Lee Peer-to-Peer -peer is a network stack of IPFS and it's also a standalone project that you can use for your own applications. You don't have to buy into IPFS to use Lee Peer-to-Peer. And it offers you things like authentication, encryption, discovery of other nodes, the routing, the network for forming, and content routing. And what does this mean? It means like you have a network, it's already established, you have like physical links, you have like virtual links, you have a bunch of links, speaking different protocols, doesn't matter. And as long as you know the peer that you want to dial to, as long as you have their ID, that instead of like being an IP address, it is a public key, you can like create a connection to that peer and then do a TLS like handshake, just like do a crypto challenge, and you know that you're talking to the right process. You know that like from all of the peers in the network, you are talking to the right one. So, okay, so what I, what I was saying is like, this network that you see here can be very heterogeneous. Like not every machine can, might have the same capabilities. And because of that, we built Leap Peer to Peer to be very modular. You don't have to buy in to every single module every single time. We, you can like, use different peer routing mechanisms, different content routing mechanisms, different transports even. And, but the primitives say the same. It's always like dial to this peer which has this public key. And Leap Peer to Peer will do like, its best effort to find using the mechanisms you provided it to. So you go from a network that only has physical links to a hyper-connected graph with, with virtual links to like an hyper-connected graph without boundaries. You can now have like browser nodes dialing to server nodes that the browser only speaks WebRTC and the server only speaks TCP, but you can find a node in the middle path that speaks both WebRTC and TCP, and you can have that node relayed for you. Or you can even go into IoT where some devices simply don't have like the full TCP stack even, like they just have some this radio protocol that like no one else speaks, so they really need some kind of relay, some kind of proxy, and since they use the same um, authentication mechanism, you can find a way to dial to that process to the network, 
and then validate that you're talking with the right device. It's pretty powerful. OK, how am I doing on time? 20 minutes so far? Cool. So I want to show you IPFS and how it works. Let's see if it, this goes well. Um, cool. Any questions so far? Feel like I'm like just bursting information? Sounds good. OK, so I have IPFS installed already in this machine. And when you install IPFS, you get like this really nice CLI. It has a bunch of commands, like to add files. Maybe I can like, can, can you read good enough here? OK. You can have some, some basic commands, like to add files, to get a file, to get a file. You can have some data structure commands, like to write your own blocks. And then like you have this daemon, uh, daemon uh, command, which basically spawns a daemon that's going to connect to the rest of the network. When you initialize, let's see if the network doesn't fail me. By the way, I brought like, my own router just in case, making sure. Let's see. OK, it was working. So the daemon is ready, right? Uh, so now I have like, the IPFS daemon, which is like, kind of this gateway to the entire IPFS network. Uh, I can see that I'm already connecting to other peers. Right now I have like three peers. Um, I just like used discovery mechanisms to find other peers on the network. Some of them might be here on this network. Some of them might be completely on different networks. Doesn't matter. And this this list will grow over time as this node gets more and more peer. So let's do some basic stuff. Let's like add some some files to it. Okay. So I added the file, and what happened here is like it tells me, oh, the, cont the content hash, like the content address of that file, is this hash here. So now I can do simple things like catting that hash. It got my file back, or I can use the local gateway to see the file that I just added. I have to add IPFS there. Cool. So I'm seeing the same file, or I can even use the global IPFS network to resolve that file for me. What is happening here when I'm doing this and I'm going to IPFS.io, I'm accessing a, an IPFS node that's on a server somewhere, and I'm telling, I want to retrieve this hash. And that node will like, query the network, query a DHT, find where that content is stored, which is this machine, dial to this machine, and get the content from me itself. That's pretty fast. Like, of course, like, we are just transferring four characters, but it was pretty fast, the, fa the fact that like, it just found this node pretty quickly. Uh, so let's make it interesting. You can like, use it to transfer any kind of files, from video to images. Uh, and one of the things that you take for granted is that like, this content hash will not change. So if I move this content from this machine to another machine, it will still be the same hash. So each time you add something to IPFS, or each time you fetch something from IPFS, you become also a seeder, a provider of that content. So if some of you downloaded this file right now, and I went away, the other peers could unload that content from your machines without having even to ask me. Cool. So let's add a f an image to the to this network. All right. An image is going to take more time. Let's make sure I'm well peer. You can see the the peer is already increased. I found way more peers on the network here. Here's the image again. Like. We just passed the entire file, and now all of you are on the permanent web. Like, you have a photo of you that's like this link will be unique forever. You know, like if you if the image still lives on the network and you have the link, you'll be able to find it this moment on the pixel scan. Uh, cool. All right. So, what can we do that's more interesting? Okay. So I have a, an immutable file storage. I know I can transfer files from one point to another. I know that I don't have to worry where the file is living. I don't have to worry where the machine is because I have process addressing. I don't, know, I don't have to worry where the, the file lives because it just like, figures out for me. So what can we do with it? And for that, I want to show you an app that we have been building, a chat app, um, that uses these IPFS primitives to offer us a Slack slash RC like experience without needing any central service. And that is Orbit. So I see some of you have laptops. Some of you don't. If you want to be part of this demo, um, if you want to be part of this demo, I can tweet this hash pretty quickly. Would that work for you? Would that be the best way? I see some people shaking heads. 
uh, pixels, camp, tweeting this hash. In this hash, you'll find like this app here. There's a version for Darwin, uh, for Darwin, for macOS, and one for Linux. Um, sorry, Windows users, we all, we are working on it. Um, and you can connect to the Wi-Fi by connecting to the interplanetary network if you want. Uh, the password is interplanetary, all lowercase. While I'm while you're doing that, I know that some of you already have the app installed, so I'm just going to launch it and show what is it doing. It's called Orbit. Just put in my name. Okay, I'm going to choose a channel. You see like very familiar interface. That's like big pixels, pixel scan, pixels, pixels. Okay, cool, so now I'm on this channel, right? And now more people here uh, are like joining this channel. It's like standard, like IRC can speak, hey, Okay, some more people here, as Joan just entered. Again, like, I want to make sure that everyone understands what's going on here. Like, just like launched a fully distributed application that offers chat. There is no central server, server like linking us together. We are just finding uh, ourselves through the IPFS network. And we are getting this really nice chat experience through a thing called CRDTs, Conflict Free Replicated Data Types where we just like model the data in a way that like as soon as I get these messages, I know how to sort them, I know how to order them. Think like operational transforms like Google Docs version two. And I can do more stuff, right? I can do like, I can drop a video. I can drop a video and the video will be streamed. Like, like people don't have to know the video beforehand. They can be streamed a video from their machine. I can like drop a picture. Are you getting the video? Auto of the GIF? Can I click it? Are you sure you want like okay. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> come on, John. Um, all right, cool. Did you play the video? Yeah. I can play the video in my machine, but it's not like interesting because I have the video in my machine. It's more interesting when you play the video in your machine because you'll see like IPFS streaming real video, and like you can stream 4K video really fast because the video gets chunked, and you can like seek to the video because I, I just like need to fetch the blocks that I need again. I just chunked the file in several parts, and now I'm just like reading the blocks that I want. I don't have to like download the entire thing. And like as more people download the video, more people are seeing the video. Isn't this cool? <laughs> Feel like I see some faces are very like surprised. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So these were my two demos. I can like show more IPFS in action after the talk. I have some something more just to finish it. Let's go back to presentation mode. I will leave the chat open. You can like still join uh, as I continue my my presentation. Cool. Okay. So we saw IPFS transferring files. We saw IPFS transferring like images, video. You can build real time distributed applications uh, using IPFS primitives. There are people that are using this just like for video distribution and streaming without having a, like this fancy chat app. There is people that use IPFS for legal documents because you have this Merkle linking. It's like secure links. So you know that like no one has tempered the link. Uh, like you know like if the hash change, then like you know someone like changed the document so it's not valid anymore. Um, there's people that like are doing um, sites just to host pictures. You can go to IPFS pics. It's, it's pretty interesting. There's people that like are moving 3D mo models around because they are so big, they really need a, a protocol that's really fast to transfer data. There are people doing the games. Of course, like this is Minecraft, it's not like a game on IPFS, but it could be. Um, people transferring like scientific data and like papers. Uh, people like hosting blogs and we entire websites. Yeah, in fact, if you go to IPFS.io, and all the websites from IPFS, they are being hosted on IPFS. There is no servers behind. And there's like totally distributed apps. As you saw one, this is another one. Cool. Okay, one more thing, which is IPLD. Um, I wanted to mention this during this talk. It's still something kind of recent. We have been working on it 
for uh, the last year. It is still under deployment on our network, but it's going to be something very transformative in how we deal with data in our applications. IPLD stands for the Interplanetary Linked Data. And what it means is like, as I said before, IPFS is this Merkle forest. You can create any kind of Merkle data structure on IPFS, but we need interplanetary linked data. We can make IPFS host any kind of other data structure natively. Like you don't have to cope with our own format. Like you can just bring Ethereum blocks, the Bitcoin blockchain, Git, BitTorrent, and like just resolve them using IPFS as you would resolve uh, an IPFS hash, as if you resolve an IPFS path. And it's, it creates this transformation where we stop having this internet of data and we start having this internet of data structures. This is really important because like, if you think all of these APIs over the web, all of these services, what they are doing is just like transforming data to data. And like, each of these APIs have their own like, interface and like, develops, uh, developers have also uh, always have to pay the cost of like, understanding how the API works, understanding how that system works and what, is, what it is doing. But like when you have this internet of data structures, you find a canonical way to do these transformations. That like you just have the network that has the data, and you can tell the network, I want a view on top of this data. Don't like, don't tell me, don't send me the data, just send me the view. And this is uh, thanks to uh, the content identifier, which is kind of like an iteration over the content address. Before we had like hashes to link to content, and now we are using content identifier that not only gives us the hash, so we know the value that we are receiving, but we also know the, the type of the contact through this multi codec. Oh, you cannot see that well, but like the red line is a multi codec that describes what is the data type that we are fetching. So, and with IPLD, as I was saying, like you'll be able to do like selectors, transformations, and views. Imagine. Uh, like being able to issue a query to the, the IPFS network where you say, I just want these nodes that like follow this criteria and you just fetch these nodes. I want these nodes to be transformed to this other view and I just want to fetch this other view. And this can be applied over any kind of data structure. Yours, the ones that are public, doesn't matter. Cool. It's really exciting. There's already prototypes available. You can play with them. It's not deployed on the main network. But there's a lot of, like the spec is finalized. You can read the spec and you can understand how it works. Uh, and you can play with the prototypes. Okay, last but not the least, the interplanetary community. So who is building all of this crazy madness peer-to-peer -peer stuff? Um, we have a really large community. Like right now we have like more than 350 people coming uh, and like contributing with ideas, reviewing specification, uh, submitting patches to code, uh, participating even in our own management process. Uh, if you go to github.com slash IPFS, you will find everything from our own process management, like our sprints, like our hangout calls are public. Like you can join any of these calls and be part of the Go IPFS Endeavor or the Jess IPFS one or the Leap to peer or even like propose an hangout over a topic that's of your interest and then you want to build something with and we'll accommodate it. And like with this, we get a lot of people to come to the same area and like collaborate on this shared research. And one of my favorite places to hang out nowadays is just this repo that started as like something simple, something that we were just like writing some ideas we had and we ended up to build in the future, but it grew to something much more. So if you go to IPFS slash notes, you'll find all sorts of issues that people open saying, I want to build a system with this requirement. Or I know about the web of trust. How can we apply the web of trust to IPFS? Or I want to put NPM on IPFS. How can it work? Uh, and NPM on IPFS is a very interesting case. It has more than like 50 comments. And you see all these people from different companies, different organizations coming to the same GitHub thread. It is like better than the mailing list. And it's like linking to other people and notifying other people that might be interested. And like suddenly, after like 50 comments, we have a thing that like put the entire NPM on IPFS, and now you can like install modules even if you are offline, which is pretty cool. Uh, I definitely, again, everything that we build, uh, that this community builds is MIT licensed, open source, everything is there. Uh, we welcome everyone to participate and to ask questions. Uh, we are still improving a lot in the documentation, um, but yeah, like if you find something that you don't understand, feel always welcome to open an issue or just appear on the RSC channel on free nodes, found IPFS, and we'll be more than happy to explain you, uh, to answer your questions. 
So yeah, uh, that's what I have, and I hope you enjoy uh, the presentation. Thank you. All right, so time for questions, I believe. We have questions there, one. Hi. Uh, it should, yeah. Okay, can you, yeah. Uh, hey, first of all, congratulations. Like, uh, I, I knew of IPFS before, and I think it's awesome. And, Thank you. Uh, th this is a, like a, a quite a long uh, question, uh, and it is like, I've seen a lot of, a lot of people like, using IPFS for, for the front end of EVM depths, like the, the Ethereum, yeah. uh, Ethereum depths. Yeah. Like I, I was, I was once uh, roaming through through the list of the apps, and I I encountered like a, a, a dark market, like the, the kind of like Silk Road and and such. Mm -hmm. And I was like asking myself, if I accessed it like through IPFS, and I had I, I was a seeder of their files, like would I be liable for something that oh, could happen? Yeah, I understand. So uh, I should repeat the question, right? So the question is. If you download or if you use IPFS to access bad bits yeah, yeah. of any kind, uh, if you become uh, legal, legally responsible for those bad bits, yeah. uh, the answer is if you download bad bits, if it's through IPFS, HTTP, TCP, whatever name protocol, and if you are serving them, making yourself exposed to the network saying you are serving them, you are always like legal, uh, legally binded to like. Be, w you are one of the persons that's like serving those bad bits to the network. It doesn't matter if it's IPFS. So the thing is, like when you are using IPFS, by default right now, if you access something, it's going to be cached locally. So if someone asks you, you have those bad bits and like he's going to serve from your machine, but you have the ability to say, I don't want to serve these ashes to the network. You might use IPFS just as like a viewer. Like, like you just use IPFS to download the content, yeah. but you don't like serve it to the network. And that has other use cases. Ima imagine mobile. You don't want mobile, like you don't want IPFS, or you don't want a mobile phone to become a full IPFS node that like it's serving like terabytes of data because it will run out of your, like it will exhaust your battery pretty quickly. So you want to have clients that know how to access the network and know how to connect, and like just selectively share some of the files. So. Yeah, like if you are downloading bad bits, then like it's kind of like your responsibility anyway. With IPFS, you have the primitives to control what you are sharing. It doesn't even have to be bad bits, right? Like you might have a family album that you want to share with yeah. your family, but you don't want the entire web to know about <laughs> it. Like you have some pictures from like I don't know some vacation you did, and you you want to say only these notes, only these peer IDs, public keys. Again, everyone gets authenticated, are able to download these bits from me. Once again, look, congratulations. Cool, thank you. More questions? Hi. Um, I was thinking that this makes a lot of sense for static data, yeah. images, videos, and so on. But I was thinking how this can apply to more traditional web apps. Think of Facebook, for instance. Because yeah. when we are accessing Facebook, we are accessing more or less a, a, a shared uh, code base and yeah. database, well, it's not that simple, but uh, we're all accessing the same thing. But if you take this literally and you have a, a base on Mars and you are disconnected from Earth, yeah. you can't access the same code base or the same database. And how would these web apps, you've already showed Orbit, which is yeah. more dynamic than just, just simple static uh, data, but how would this work for traditional uh, web apps? And how would companies have to change the way that they approach building a web app in order to make it interplanetary? Yeah, so the question was how to build dynamic apps on IPFS and how can that work over an immutable database? So back again on the example of Orbit. This is a chat app and it's fully dynamic. What it's using underneath is this module that we, you can check it out called RBDB. And RBDB offers you primitives like get and put that you are used to have access to another, it's a key value store. And it looks pretty simple at the top, but what's doing underneath is like just receiving all of these data events that come from several sources and getting, like, ordering those events and like exposing the, the final state of that value to you. Like you do get on a key, you get a value, but the value that you're getting access to 
is not something that was just stored in the machine. It's something that was coalesced from several events that happened on several machines. And like, as soon as like, you replicate this data over the machines, everyone gets the same final view. Like, um, instead of like, you having to have the work of doing the coalescing yourself, like to do the merge yourself, Imagine like uh, the Google Docs. Like your Google Docs, you are very used to just like write. You know, it's like completely syncing over the wire, and like you can see other people typing. It is using something called CRDTs. Google Docs is operational transforms. This is using CRDTs, which is like operational transforms version two. It's something that's like more restrict and gives you like stronger uh, guarantees of all the data is going to be replicated, and now the final state will actually be the same. Um, so you can build an entire Facebook news feed using this as well, uh, because the data will just like coalesce. And for the, the application developer, like the web developer that's used uh, to get like a get and put API, they'll get the same API, but like IPFS is doing all the hard work of like converging these uh, data events. Does, does that answer your question? Sim yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Think about like a. So you definitely have to build your own semantics for your own web app. But think think of this as like a database that's not hosted anywhere. You just know that it's like data being created, and you know because like Warbit, for example, the reason why it syncs so quickly <laughs> is because IPFS also offers PubSub. So we are publishing on this channel pixels, and all the nodes that are interested on this channel will get like these events. They will get all these messages one by one. And then you know for sure using CRDTs that independently of the order that you get these messages, these data events, everyone will see the same final state. So now you can do that for this for a news feed uh, as well. Uh, it, you should not use like a, a single key value store or single key value for your entire state of your application. You should just have several key, key value pairs uh, and create a semantics on top of that. But it will be like, would you like to give an example of a, uh, an app that you are thinking um, right now? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's the same thing. Like when you start to a database, you don't notify people that there is new data. You create something on the side saying, "Hey, like someone sent you a message," and you can use, for example, PubSub for that. Like I can subscribe to my own username. And then like, everyone that publishes something to me just publishes something on the, that topic uh, with my username. And then I, since I'm subscribing to it, I get that event. I get that notification. And then I can fetch the data related to that notification. Makes more sense? Cool. So, uh, one more. Hi, David. Uh, still re related uh, with, with this question, like you had some uh, picture of the Internet of Things. I think it, it's kind of, um, how does it apply? How can you use it for the Internet of Things? Okay. It's like the, you have this PubSub system, yeah. you have uh, multiple devices that are really publishing a lot of uh, different data, yeah. and you can consume that from the, the, the Orbit database. Mm -hmm. So how can IPFS work for the Internet of Things? Yeah. Um, so the, the idea or the goal is to make sure that the protocol, the primitives, like getting, resolving these hashes, connecting to other nodes, are the same. So that means that like, you can build an app that runs on the browser, and then you can like, port that app and like, make it run in a, a, a less powerful device. Uh, that still runs the same language that you wrote the application for the browser, of course, but like IPFS is going to do the hard work of like taking, for example, in the browser you just support WebRTC, HTTP, and WebSockets. That's like the transport that you have. You cannot add anything else. Yeah. But in like a native application, you have like 
the full network stack. Like you can do whatever, every transport that there were ever uh, existed. And you can like move this browser application to a native one and like just switch, swap the transports, WebRTC to some other transport. And for the application, it will still do like, I want to dial to this peer, dial by the public key. Uh, you will not have to change your code base at all. Like it will still be the same application, the same language, the same primitives. If you want to go now port this application that's running on the desktop to an Internet of Things device, which, for example, the transport that it has available is only Bluetooth. Like the only thing that that thing supports is Bluetooth. You cannot do anything at all uh, more. You can do anything else. Then you just like swap the TCP protocol and you put the Bluetooth one, and the primitives for your app will still be the same. Okay. So you can just like have this port runtime freedom mounting on top of IPFS because the network problems get solved by you by having these very modular uh, transports, these modu modular uh, network uh, primitives that expose very well-defined interfaces so that you can like, swap them out back and forth uh, without breaking how your application is developed. Yeah. Of course, like, if, you have, if you swap your app from a browser or from a desktop to a, an Internet of Things device, and then like, every device that that, uh, that, uh, that device is connected only speaks Bluetooth, meaning that there is no middle where there is a device that speaks, for example, TCP and Bluetooth, then like, you cannot access to the rest of the network because you are, just, you are isolated from the rest of the network. If you have no common bridge to access, yeah. to, to talk with the rest of the network, it, it will just not find the rest of the nodes. But as soon as you put a node there, and it is like, very exciting, right? Like, you, as you grab this node, you say, okay, this, this is a disjoint network. It doesn't have access to the rest of the internet. And I'm going to put this node here that speaks both Bluetooth and like TCP. And then suddenly all of these nodes are accessible through the network. And now the, networks, the nodes in the network can access these nodes as well. Okay, thanks, David. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, more questions? Okay, one more. Uh, the what? Database is running on the nodes. Well, it's a, as a yeah, the database has a replica. The node is a client? The, the node is a client and the server at the same time. It, it, Sorry, the, again? The node is a client and the server at the same time. We don't use the distinguishing. Oh, okay. The, yeah, yeah, it's like a full, speaks a full protocol. Writes, reads, and like sends events about the data that was changed to the other nodes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So uh, you have a database for key values and uh, yeah. uh, push? Push, yeah. yeah, so. Is there anything else, uh, any other database that uh, exists on top of it? Uh, there, there is other experiments. I, I was just like showing this one RPDB because it's the one that like this app is using. Uh, but again, it's a file storage layer. You can build whatever database you want. Um, and this one is just like smarter because it knows how to transfer the changes and like auto close these changes so that's like instead of having several databases that then you have to synchronize just like synchronizes for you just coalesces the data that exists on the several um, databases the several nodes for you Make sense? okay yes yeah, so it, it writes in several different uh, the internals is that it writes into several different hashes and then it takes that yeah uh, like each like value is going to be that you were hash. saying right yeah. each value is going to be a different hash so okay. each time you start a value like each time you start a value or you did a value, it's going to be always a different dash. And then you broadcast to the network saying, hey, network, that are interested for this namespace from this database, there was a change. There was something that happened. And that change has this hash. And then the other node does the, does, makes the decision of like, oh, I'm interested in these changes, so now I'm going to fetch the change from the network. Which means like you have this pub sub layer that's like very thin and very fast because it's just like, transferring this metadata, and then the nodes make the decision, oh, I want to get this data. So, and because it's the node getting the data, it can get the data from the nodes next to it, or from a node that's like very far. So, as more people start replicating it, fast, the faster it gets. Uh, but then like once it gets all of the, the events data, all of the things that happen, then like basically pastes them onto this RBDB, and it does like the CRDT magic that then when you do the next get, you know we are going to get the final site, the final value after all the changes happen, that happen. Okay, that's it. Cool. More questions? We still have seven minutes. 
Hi, David. Hey. Um, I wasn't sure exactly where the line was between libp2p and, um, and IPFS. So I was wondering, is, oh. is libp2p purely about discovering and communicating between nodes and therefore might be useful to any networking application? Yes. Or does it use some of the things that IPF, the unique features of IPFS, like uh, data? Um, so, yeah. Uh, so uh, the question is, can people use libp2p uh, by them, like without using IPFS? And if there is other applications using libp2p already? So, Giving the full context, like we were building this network stack for IPFS because it is very common for everyone that's doing peer-to-peer -to, -peer to like build a new network protocol uh, because like there is a lot of problems in the network, like traversing nets, discovering other nodes, doing the routing. It's really like it's a really hard problem actually. Uh, and after we started like building these things, and like since we had such ambitious goals as like running on the browser, running on IoT, running on all sorts of devices. Uh, we started making it modular. And when we started making it modular, we started realizing, oh, like, we can like, easily expand and like, augment the capabilities of peer-to-peer. -peer. This might be interesting for other groups that are building peer-to-peer -peer applications. So we like, kind of like, promoted peer-to-peer -to, -peer to become its like, full standalone project. And now it's something that IPFS uses, but like, peer-to-peer -peer also has a life of itself. It's kind of like one of the first class projects that we build. Right now, for example, one of the things we showed the last two, two weeks ago in DEF CON 2 in China was the Ethereum uh, nodes running on top of peer to peer So right now, Ethereum uh, uses a, a, a custom protocol that they developed called RLPX that enables them to also do things like not traversal and stream multiplexing, but they cannot run Ethereum nodes on the browser. And we upgraded the Ethereum nodes um, to use peer to peer and we showed and if you know running completely on the browser. It's pretty exciting. Like you add literally a URL that you load and you download this JavaScript and if suddenly you're running this peer-to-peer -peer distributed application that can run smart contracts on this like global computer network. Uh, and there is more people, for example, Matrix, uh, Matrix.org is also looking into peer-to-peer -to -peer because like right now their blocker is that they have to ask every user to host a server to be their central point to connect to the rest of the network. And we peer to peer again. They can just like load a JavaScript blog and like have the entire app working. So they are also very interested. And there's more people like doing experiments uh, with it. Uh, so yes, and we have an implementation in Go and other in JavaScript. There is uh, a start in Rust, Swift, Python, and Java, but those are not as mature. Uh, we invest a lot of time in the JavaScript one and the Go one. So yeah, thank you. Any other question? All right. Thank you, everyone. This was awesome. Super excited to be here. I hope that we get some corridor conversations. Yeah, thank you.